because it happens. Right, with that, you want to introduce me? Sure. Well, good evening. I'm Jeff Kiley, and I'm the director of the Northwest New Mexico Council of Governments. A huge fan of Gallup Solar, although I'm not always able to get over here for the Gallup Solar meetings, um, as I travel a lot throughout the region and throughout the uh, state and country. Um, uh, filming us this evening is one of the Council of Government staff, Carrie House, who in addition to being a really good planner with us, is also a film professional. Uh, so local talent within the community that we are uh, certainly very much uh, supporting. Um, uh, without much ado, I would like to uh, introduce uh, tonight's presentation. Doug Lenberg is, a, in addition to being a good friend of mine personally, um, is also a client of uh, one of our programs at the Council of Governments. It's a, a loan fund to help small businesses. And so he's been uh, part of that loan fund program with us for several years. And um, we have been very excited uh, by the breakthroughs that Doug is making has, and has been making uh, over the years in uh, super energy efficient and affordable housing uh, using technologies that he himself has innovated and has actually had tested. I'll, I'll have, he'll tell you all about it. But uh, be, because of the strength of the research and the uh, demonstration models that he, he's been able to bring forth, we think it's really uh, got some potential for all of us that are interested in alternative construction, alternative energy, that whole arena. And so I, I, I thought uh, Doug has had some medical issues recently, and this is his first time out, so I'm, I'm bringing Doug uh, uh, here to this gathering to share with us his exciting work and to see if it's something that we can continue to learn from as a community. Um, and uh, so without further ado, I introduce Doug Lenberg. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you all very much for inviting me back. Uh, like, I, like Jeff said, this is my first time back. And I'm the president of Real Green Building Systems. Um, I'm going to wait, I think, until... He gets, oh, that's okay. We're just going to get started. Did everyone get a piece of this material right here? If you didn't get a piece of that, please uh, pass that around. I'd like everyone to get a piece of that so that you'll know what I'm talking about. When I get to that point, a net zero home has been a goal of mine for a very, very long time. And it's been so long. I started in the wholesale plumbing and heating and air conditioning business in uh, 1980. And I found out that I could start working with code officials to get certain things from the plumbing business approved by code officials so that we could use them and make certain things affordable in the average house. So that's what I actually started doing back in 1980, working for a wholesale supply company. I started with a little piece of pipe called PEX pipe. Now, by this point in time, you have all probably seen this before. It's called cross-link polyethylene pipe, and it was used to replace failing copper. Copper was failing all over the country. So I wrote the code approval in conjunction with the State of New Mexico Construction Industries Division. We worked closely together in 1990, and we wrote the first code approval statewide in the United States. We did it in New Mexico. People don't even know that, but we were the first state to do this. But more importantly, what could we use this pipe for? And why was it so important to get this pipe ready to go? This pipe turned out to be the foundation for plumbing systems, radiant heating systems, reclaimed water systems. It became the foundation for just about everything that I'm gonna talk about this evening. And this is how we came to what I call a real integrated solution to a net zero house. We have photovoltaic energy production, solar thermal, domestic hot water, plumbing-based fire suppression, water reclamation, and solar thermal radiant heating that really works. Okay, we're gonna start off with one thing at a time. The first thing we're gonna start off with is plumbing-based fire suppression systems. Now, 
you probably aren't going to buy a fire suppression system. Most people don't want a fire suppression system. They're scared to death of them. First of all, you think if you have a fire that the entire house is going to go off and you're going to flood everything. That's not the case. In my systems, one fire, one sprinkler head, it's out in 30 seconds. Now, why is that important? Because the plumbing system in the house becomes your fire protection system. Okay, the plumbing system in your house becomes your fire protection system. If you do one house with a plumbing based fire suppression system, you get up to 50% reduction in your homeowner's insurance. It pays for itself in one year, two years at the most. It's peace of mind. If you do an entire subdivision with all the houses having plumbing-based fire suppression system, you don't need fire hydrants. You don't need water mains. Now, I don't know if any of you are like my friends that live in Monument Valley, but Charlotte Salt and Larry Holiday live in Monument Valley. They don't have a fire hydrant anywhere near their house, and they're never going to get a fire hydrant anywhere near their house. So when they came to my house, Charlotte said, I would love to have this in my house because then I don't have to worry about a fire hydrant. I don't have to worry about water production. So that became a very important cornerstone for what we started with. Now, having said that, obviously it has to be in the ceiling. You have to have the fire protection system in the ceiling, otherwise it won't work. So you have the plumbing in the ceiling. So if you live in a cold area, nobody lives in a cold area, right? Gallup's not cold. It never gets down to like minus five or minus 10 in Gallup. I know that. You guys are like the sunny area here. So you have to worry about your pipes freezing in your attics, right? Pipes freeze in the attic. So that was a challenge that I had. How do I make a house where the pipes don't freeze in an attic? Well, I found out this little piece of material that you have in your hand, that little piece of material is nothing more than a styrofoam cup. Okay? It's nothing more than a styrofoam cup. It's called expanded polystyrene. That's it. What does it do? Well, if I told you that this right here was equal to six inches of fiberglass insulation, you'd look at me like I was a crazy man. So everybody did look at me like I was a crazy man. I said that's equal to six inches of insulation. So what do you do when you start coming up with this stuff and you don't know the answer? You go to Sandia National Laboratories. You may have all heard of Sandia National Laboratories and Los Alamos National Laboratories. You go to Sandia National Laboratories and you say, guys, I want to build a house. I want the house instrumented so that we can test all of these technologies. So I got a research grant and I built a house in Farmington. I built this house in Farmington. So Sandia instrumented this house as it was being built. So it's now consistently being used for testing since I moved in in 2009. That was the first thing you do. Then you come back to Sandy and say, okay, now that we built the house, we need another research grant because we got to find out how come this styrofoam cup stuff works. So we got another research grant. So that's two from Sandia. So what I'm going to tell you is you can write down all the questions you want to. I cannot answer the science. Every one of these six PhDs that wrote these reports is smarter than I am. I will be happy to give you their telephone number. But do not question the fact that what I'm telling you is a fact. This is not speculation. These are facts. And that's why I went to Sandy and Los Alamos. So, this one here is probably my best. Dr. Andy McGowan took the styrofoam cup and he got liquid nitrogen. Anybody know what the temperature of liquid nitrogen is? Come on, Chris, what's the temperature of liquid nitrogen? Minus 419 degrees. He took light liquid nitrogen and he put it in a styrofoam cup 
an eighth of an inch and it started getting his hand cold. So he took the second styrofoam cup and his hand got a little warmer. Took the third and then the fourth and by the time he got to the fourth cup he was at one half of an inch of expanded polystyrene and it stopped the liquid nitrogen from cooling his hand. So, liquid nitrogen, boiling water, styrofoam cup technology is pretty much what we call it. Styrofoam cup technology is just super simple. That piece of material that you have in your hand right now wraps my house with half inch. I have one inch on the roof of my house and no insulation in my attic whatsoever. Nothing. I have one inch on my roof. This is my roof right here. And you notice this, there's a ladder right here. This is a very heavy duty metal ladder. You'll be able to look at it when you want to come up afterwards. Um, don't say anything about the ladder, but JT Baca, the head of the Construction Industries Division, uh, Plumbing Bureau for New Mexico, weighs 325 pounds. JT said, I'm going to come to your house. You build me a ladder so I can get on your roof and get in your attic and make sure you never put insulation up there. And I said, okay. So we have this ladder up there and you can see there's the one inch and this is all the insulation we have. That's it. So now we've taken care of the piping in the attic. So the piping is not going to freeze because we have one inch of insulation on the roof. And that's a good thing that the piping is not going to freeze. Once we found that out, we also knew that we had other characteristics of this. How are we going to heat this house? We wanted to heat this house using the same material. So we took a half inch and we put it under the floor. We have a half inch of this under the floor of the house, under the concrete, and we have the infamous PEX tubing again. We have the infamous PEX tubing in the floor, right down on top of the insulation. We have the mesh up above it. You want your tubing right down on the insulation so that your heat that's on the bottom is coming up into the concrete so that you have a nice even heat in your concrete. So we put that in there. We have, by the way, these guys have got something like a hundred thermocouples. They have thermocouples in the dirt under my house, on top of the insulation, under the insulation, next to the tubing. They have thermocouples everywhere in the concrete. So when they started taking data, they knew exactly what they were getting. So now that we did that, we started figuring based on what this insulation has a value, what do we need for BTUs to heat this house? It's 2,600 square foot house. 800 square foot in the multi-purpose room. Multi-purpose rooms, we're gonna get into that later, but some people call them garages. <laughs> Mine is not really a garage. I have a multi-purpose room, 800 square feet. You can use it as a garage if you want to, but it's fully fire protected and it's heated. So we took the entire 2,600 square feet. We took the value of what the scientists said we had and we said, okay, we need about 10,000 BTUs to heat and cool this house, built this way. Now, 10,000 BTUs or approximately three BTUs a square foot is really a low amount of BTUs. The average is 30 BTUs a square foot for a house with forced air. We use three. So how do you produce three BTUs a square foot efficiently? Well, you go back to Los Alamos and you say, okay guys, I want to produce three BTUs a square foot. How much will solar thermal produce? So they told me what I needed for solar thermal panels. So you can see, come on in, have a seat. So you can see that we have on the roof right here, well, I think I can do that. There we go. Right there on the roof, I have four solar thermal panels, four by 10. 
Now, we didn't realize, but at the time, that was overkill. We really thought we were going to need 4 four by 10 solar thermal panels because not only do they heat my house, they heat my hot water. Now, whenever you're building a house, I don't know how many of you are married, but whenever you're building a house, if you're a guy, the first thing you concern yourself with is the happiness of the wife. Period. If the water tank is not 80 gallons and she can't take a shower when she wants to, there's going to be a problem. So we got an 80 gallon tank, we got four solar thermal panels, and they're heating the water primary to the tank to make sure we have hot water, secondary to the radiant floor heating system. And the control mechanism, come on in over there. So the control mechanism for the radiant floor heating system was studied by Sandia National Laboratories to make sure that it would be an efficient system. Y'all with me right now? I'm looking at some heads that are nodding around here. So what you did is what we have created was a solar thermal heated home with a very small system that needed it. Of course, you're going to have a backup. You have to have a backup, and our backup is gas. Now, the gas backup is right there. This is a very tiny, instantaneous water heater, and this particular one was made by the Naritz Company, and you don't need a boiler. What we found is you needed a fully modulating, 98% efficient LP convertible to natural gas to go back and forth. Boiler, well not boiler, but instantaneous water heater that goes down to the 10,000 BTUs that you heard me talk about earlier and up to 199,000 BTUs should you ever need that. Now this particular boiler came along at the end. In the very beginning, when we first built the house, this was the boiler that was heating my home. This is a two kilowatt Lang boiler and this is a German manufactured pump underneath it. This little boiler was heating my home and it was heating my home okay but it was only getting to 63 degrees right there in the house and 63 degrees was not comfortable enough for my wife. So if that's not comfortable enough for your wife, what do you do? You get more heat in the house. And that's when we went to this natural gas instantaneous water heater as a backup. And being 98% efficient, my entire gas usage last year, I believe, was 600 therms of gas for the whole year. It wasn't even a big deal. But it worked. So that's how we get to the water until we get to the installation. Now, the other component that is really... I love talking about this component, but unfortunately, municipalities have not bought into water reclamation yet. Okay? The municipalities are a little bit behind in the water reclamation. I cut down my water usage by over 60% by reclaiming my water. I take the water from the showers. I take it from the laundry. I take it from the lavatories. And I reclaim it. I put it in this tank right here. I add hydrogen peroxide to it about four drops a day. Just drops, you don't need a lot of hydrogen peroxide. About four drops a day and then I reuse the water to flush the toilets in the house. And I found out that I had so much water left from my showers, from the 80 gallon water heater that's been solar heated, because now my wife can take a 15 minute shower, very important. I found out that I had so much water left that I can go outside and I can water my trees, my grass, and my shrubs, and water my garden, in addition to flushing my toilets. I have the only carbon positive house in Farmington. The state of New Mexico Forestry Department told me that for every tree that two people plant, if you plant your two people in a house, you plant one tree, you're carbon neutral so you don't have a carbon footprint. 
I have 15 trees in my backyard. And I have a small amount of grass right here. And I have a garden that's producing my vegetables. Now, the bad news is I can reclaim the water, so I cut my water bill down to $5 a month. Well, the city of Farmington added a $20 a month charge for using the meter to use the $5 worth of water. So even though I can cut my water bill down, I still have to pay them for the meter. So where this really makes sense is where you don't have a municipality that you have to hook up to. And this is what I told my friends in Monument Valley. I told Charlotte Salton, I told Larry Holiday, you, when you build a house, we're gonna be out in the middle of nowhere. We can do all of this. We can do the plumbing-based fire suppression system very simply. We can do the reclaimed water, because as you can see from this chart right here, shower and bath water is 35%. Toilet flushing is 30%. You take all of this water that comes into your house, started with a cistern, 1,500 gallon cistern. You take this water that comes into your house, you run it through your plumbing system in the ceiling, which is also your fire protection system, so you know you're safe, right, in case the stove starts on fire. I've had that happen, I know. You run it through the fire protection system, you run it through the plumbing, you take a shower with it, then you put it in the tank. When it comes out of the tank, you water your trees, your grass, your shrub, and your garden. Does it get any easier than that? That's what you can do with your water. Now, this house that I built also is built out of recycled lumber. I didn't want to go out to the lumber yard and buy 400 studs <laughs> and have one third of the studs go wonky on me as soon as I pop the bundle. So I found recycled lumber, finger jointed lumber. And you can see with finger jointed lumber, it doesn't look any different. That's finger jointed lumber right there. But it's stronger, it's straighter, and it holds the weight properly. When you do the finger jointed lumber, you can go on 24 inches on center, not 16. You can put your roof joists right on your studs. And do you know why we have two by six walls and two by 10 walls and two by 12 walls? Does anybody know why we have those? Do you think it has anything to do with the strength of the wall? <coughs> Seriously. That's it. It has to do with fiberglass insulation. So what would happen if you don't need fiberglass insulation? You make a two by four wall, 24 inches on center, and you cut the cost of your lumber by what? One third on an average house? And I've gotten this stuff to the point now, I'm, I'm not selling this material, guys. Don't get me wrong. I, I talked to Lowe's in Farmington. They're stocking it now. It's very inexpensive. Any of you tomorrow can go out and buy as much of this as you want, take the siding off your house, put it on your house, put the siding back on, and you'll cut your energy bills tremendously. It's super simple to do. But when you put that material in with recycled lumber and you build an entire structure with this whole concept in mind, you cut all of your energy requirements down. Now that was very important. When they did the energy requirements study, Dr. Andy McGowan from Los Alamos said, okay, by doing solar thermal energy and by doing this system, you cut your energy requirements down on your electric to about 400, 450 kilowatt hours a month. So you don't need a 10 kW system to run an average house. You can run an average house on a four kilowatts right now. And you can make it net zero with a four kilowatt system, which is very affordable now. 4 kW system, I don't know where Bill went, but he'll tell you it is. Much more affordable than a 10 kW. So now you can take a 4 kW system, you can go out in the middle of nowhere, you can run a well pump, or you can run a pump that just pulls the water out of a cistern. It produces enough energy to make your fire protection system run. 
it, may, it produces enough energy to make your reclaimed water system run. If you want to go with a little electric boiler, it will run this. Or if you want to go with a gas one, you can put it on LP gas and have LP as a backup. The system works, but you have to do the system. Now, having said that, if this were expensive, nobody would want to do it. Well, I got to tell you, folks, as a matter of fact, nobody wants to do it because it's too inexpensive. I just talked to a builder the other day in Durango, and I said, I want you to build a house up here using my system, and it'll cost you $100 a square foot to put all of this stuff in there. Photovoltaic, solar thermal, water reclamation, fire protection. And the guy looked at me and said, why would I do that? I'm getting $250 a square foot, and I'm not putting anything in. He said, I don't want to put in a cheap system. I want to make a lot of money. So the problem has not been whether it works or not. It's whether people believe it or not, and whether we can get builders to do it. We would like the builders to do it. My goal is to have everyone have homes that are fire protected, solar thermally heated, photovoltaically powered, that you can comfortably live in and not worry about it. That's my goal. So, when I told you, I went to the National Builders Association right here. This is the National Association of Home Builders. This is their report that said that this fire protection system, this simple fire protection system is one of the greenest things that you can put in a home because it's so simple and it works on the plumbing. That's what they put in the report. What they publicly said was, no way are we gonna support fire protection systems in houses. So you can see where we have an issue. Now I'm gonna show you how this works because it's really simple. This little cover plate right here. Here again, we go with the, the wife. My wife did not wanna see this thing in the ceiling. So we have a cover plate now that's white. You got a white ceiling. You can walk in my house, and I think Carrie was in my house, Jeff was in my house, and it took them quite a while just to find the sprinkler heads. But the simple thing is one sprinkler head for 100 square feet. So if you got a 2,000 square foot house, you need 20 heads. It's really relatively simple to figure out what you need. The plumber can put it in. Teaching a plumber to do it is super simple since I wrote the book on it. This got published by the International Code Council in 2013, and I was one of the acknowledged co-authors of this book for the International Code Council. It's called Residential Fire Sprinkler Systems, Design, Installation, and Code Administration. I made it so that the plumber can put it in when he's plumbing the house with the plastic pipe in the attic. It's not $5 a square foot. It's about a buck a square foot with this system. It burns off, if the, if the ceiling reaches 135 degrees, this little cover comes right off right there. Those things fall right off. This little thing comes down right there, and when that reaches 165 degrees, the water sprays out in the room. So you got a 12 by 12 room, one sprinkler head covered it. So my grandson and my granddaughter, God forbid they ever start playing with matches in the room, they're taken care of, and I can sleep better knowing that they're covered. And you never have to test it. If you take a shower and water comes out of the faucet, your sprinkler system's working. It's a very, very simple way to do it. So these guys at the National Association of Home Builders produced this beautiful report, showed my four-port fitting. They got everything on there, and it is a green item definitely designated that way. Recycled finger jointed lumber, designated green item. All of this stuff has been designated green products. Okay, this is green. I don't know if all of you know what's been going on with the landfills across the country, but everybody, the environmentalists are really, really, really against styrofoam going into the landfills because styrofoam never breaks down. 
we want styrofoam to not break down because it's going to be on my ceiling and it's going to be on my walls and it's going to be under my concrete. We want this to not break down. It's water resistant. It's fire resistant. It's got a 25-5 flame and smoke spread. It's class A rated. You can't get too much better than this. This material here, PEX A pipe and only PEX A, can burn and it doesn't put off any toxicity. It's the only material that ever passed the New York State Modified Pittsburgh Protocols for non-toxicity of a burning plastic. So we have this in the ceiling. This is what we're using for our fire protection system, for our plumbing system. It doesn't get anybody sick. It's not copper. It doesn't leach anything into the water. These are the things that are the basis for what we're doing. Now, having said that, and we've got the, uh, we got these guys on board now, you know, the NAHBA, we had to figure out, is it worth anything to anybody? We're going to go back to our price per, value, um, per square foot. So I went to Los Alamos National Laboratories and I requested a research grant. And I requested it from Dr. Stephen R. Booth. Steve Booth was the, I believe, the leading economist at Los Alamos. Nothing was done in economics at Los Alamos without going through Stephen Booth. Steve decided my project needed to have a value put on it. it. Took him 12 months to come out with this report. 12 months for Los Alamos National Laboratories to determine that yes, a net zero house can be cost effective. And indeed, the one that we built for my father, disabled American veteran, in 2012 in Elephant Butte Lake has everything in it, 4K W photovoltaics, plumbing-based fire suppression, it's ADA, he can roll his wheelchair anywhere he wants to. My dad's 85 years old. We built this house in Elephant Butte for $86.11 a square foot with everything. Of course, I had to do it myself, pretty much myself. General contractor was 95 years old, so I just helped him. But he had more knowledge than I'm ever going to get, I'll tell you that. When I showed him a recycled 2x4 lumber, he said, this is the cat's meow. We're going to build this house out of that. We fought some building officials. Don't get me wrong, we fought some building officials to get this approved and to get it done. And even when we got done and we got a 50 Hertz rating or a 48 Hertz rating before we turned on the photovoltaic, even with a 48 Hertz rating, the building officials looked at us and said, you can't do that. Even with a 48 Hertz rating. <laughs> 48 Hertz rating on a scale, 100 is what the average house is, 130 is normal houses, the lower you get, the better you are. As soon as we turned off the photovoltaic, we hit net zero. Well, I, I think what he's asking, what, what's the unit mean, HERS? Home Energy Rating Service is what HERS is. It's just a home energy rating service, and these people get paid a lot of money to go make sure that the house will meet these standards. Now, that was very important in the state of New Mexico, because if you went out to apply for it, we actually made the platinum level on the New Mexico, what did they call this program? New Mexico Sustainable Building Tax Credits. We actually made the platinum level and they took it away from us because they moved us down one to gold because they didn't know how to do reclaimed water. No one had ever done a reclaimed water system in New Mexico that was technically a plumbing component. In order to do reclaimed water legally, you can't do it under the EPA. The EPA will mess with you all day long. They're gonna make you put a cistern outside and you're gonna to have to go through all kinds of issues. So what I did in conjunction with the state of New Mexico and the gentleman that's running the plumbing board, JT Baca, we have a reclaimed water system that has the uniform plumbing code shield on the side. It is a plumbing component just like a water heater. So it does not fall under the EPA. It's a plumbing component. 
You have to play with the code sometimes. You've got to play with the building official sometimes. But the fact of the matter is I'm playing with nine, uh, seven scientists from Los Alamos and uh, Sandia, and they can go talk to them all day long. They got PhDs. I don't. I will listen to these guys all day long. So Dr. Booth went in, and he filled this out. It took him a year to do it. This grant, by the way, in order to get his services was a $100,000 grant. I've had over $220,000 worth of research grants from Sandia and Los Alamos combined to see if all of this stuff works. And obviously it does. Otherwise I would be divorced. <laughs> no, I'm, my wife and I have 32 wonderful years together and the last seven of them have been in this particular research house and she is very, very happy there. So a happy wife has made for my happy life. Then he went out, Dr. Booth, the next year, and we had some builders and building officials said, we want a sensitivity study. We want you to prove that you can replicate this and make sure that it is going to be about the same price. So we did another house, and it was $79.62 a square foot. So the scientists <coughs> have said what it should or what it could cost. I shouldn't say should. Every builder's entitled to make whatever they wish to make, and that's just fine. Okay? But what I'm telling you is that we want to get this, we want to get this stuff, we want to get this concept out there. We want to have fully fire protected subdivision. This is a subdivision in Phoenix, Arizona. Guy built it, got everything ready, did not put any fire hydrants in. They wouldn't let him build in it because he didn't have any fire hydrants. Now, I don't know if any of you noticed that I didn't say anything about water. I just said fire hydrants. My understanding is you don't have to have water to the fire hydrants. You just have to have the fire hydrants. <laughs> to get the development money, you just have to have the fire hydrants. You don't have to have the water. And if you go to the state fire marshal's office in New Mexico and ask him, what's the percentage of the fire hydrants in the state of New Mexico that don't have water coming out of them or that have substandard water coming out of them, you will be amazed at the amount of fire hydrants that have no water. What percentage? <laughs> Last I heard, it was 37%. Last I heard. I'm not even sure if that's accurate anymore, but I will tell you that Two years ago, I believe it was two years ago, there was an apartment fire in Albuquerque. I don't know if any of you remember seeing it on TV, a big apartment fire in the South Valley. All the fire stations arrived and they built this styrofoam, not styrofoam, but a polystyrene tank in the middle of the road to put water in that they could suck out of that tank to put on the apartment buildings. None of the fire hydrants around the building had water coming out of them. They had a subdivision two years ago in Valencia County. Fire hydrants weren't even hooked up to water mains. But all you had to do was get the fire hydrant in the ground to get the money to continue building. Imagine the builder's surprise when they show up and they go to hook up and there's no water line there, just a fire hydrant. So what I'm telling you is this thing about infrastructure costing so much money, it does. Infrastructure is outrageously expensive. This little subdivision right here, we started with 22 lots in Farmington, New Mexico in 2006. We built one house. I didn't build it. The developer built one house. Unfortunately, he turned out to not be a really good guy. He turned out to be a crook. No one has built in that subdivision yet since 2006 because one requirement says you have to have a fire protection system in every house because there are no fire hydrants in here. There's no fire hydrants. There's very narrow roads. And I saved the developer right here. I saved the developer a few hundred thousand dollars on the subdivision because he agreed we would put a fire protection system in every house for a cost of a dollar a square foot. That's it. And the city of Farmington said, because you're willing to do that, we won't require a fire hydrant in this 22-lot area. And we'll let you have narrow roads. 
So these lots, I believe, are down to like $30,000 now, $32,000 if I'm not mistaken, and nobody will build there. So even though we do it right, we get the infrastructure changes, we get everything done, even though we get it right, you're still going to have builders and you're going to have building officials and you're going to have challenges to get this done. But make no mistake, it's done. I've been living in it since 2009. And one of the tests that we did back in 2010, I don't have it up here, but we did a, an exterior surface temperature with an infrared gun for Los Alamos. No, that was Sandia. We did it for Sandia. It was minus 28 degrees outside on the outside of my house on the walls. And inside my house, it was 72 degrees. It works. That's all I can tell you. It works. And that's why I've got all of these reports here to show that it works. I have a report here that shows from uh, ANPAC insurance that he gave a 50% reduction in my homeowner's insurance. Will everyone do that for you? I don't know. The insurance companies need to be trained. I don't know if they will all do it for you. This right here, appraisals. I told you we'd get back to the multi-purpose room that some people call a garage. If you fire protect and heat that area of your house, it's no longer called a garage. For appraisal purposes, you can call it a multi-purpose room. If you want to use it as a garage, great, go for it. If you don't, you want to put a pool table in there and make it a man cave. I don't know, Jeff, you into man caves? You could make your garage a man cave. If you wanted to do that, you could do it and it would be appraised the same price as the rest of the house. That was very important for my father. He's 85 years old. The house needed to appraise so that he could afford to get it on his disabled veterans money. So that worked out very well for him. So these things, you have to look at everything when you're doing this as a totality. But to be honest with you, it's primarily based on the plumbing-based fire suppression system and the PEX pipe and what it can do for you in the overall scheme of everything. Questions? I don't want to keep you up all night, so I'm ready for questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question on, uh, on uh, wood stoves or coal burn stoves in lieu of uh, propane or natural gas because you live in a remote area and you have a lot of wood. And... You can use a wood stove in a house like this, but you'd need to make sure that you would open your windows a lot because a house like this is pretty tight. Yeah. Yeah. You can still have wood stoves. You can have, uh, you know, wood burning fireplaces. You can have any of that. But I will tell you this, it's going to heat you up real quick. One of the tests that we did is we turned on the stove one time in the kitchen just to see how quickly we could heat up the house. And boy, that was stupid. I should never do that. <laughs> so it heated it up way too fast. Yes, ma'am. A related question. Um, what about breathability? Is it, you just have to open windows when you want more fresh air? Or is there a circulation system? I have an IAQ, okay? I have an indoor air quality unit. We thought, I took the indoor air quality unit course, so I'm well versed on that. We thought we would need a certain number of air exchanges throughout the day. As it's turning out, because our attic doesn't have any insulation, we have four feet up in the attic with nothing but half-inch sheetrock between the house and the attic. So my house actually turns out to be breathing much more. So we very rarely turn on the indoor air quality unit and only in the winter or when we're getting a haboob through Farmington, you know, occasionally we get haboobs through Farmington, so you gotta close everything up. Then you turn on your indoor air quality unit for about 30 minutes, and you're fine. Most of the time, we're basing it on having plants in the house. We have plants in the house. My house averages a 35% humidity level. 12 months a year, I average 35%. Doesn't go up, doesn't go down. One of the current tests that's going on right now in my house, and this is from a building official in Farmington, he said to me, I want to know why you don't have mold in your attic, because your attic is sealed. He said, you've got to have moisture, you've got to have mold, you've got to have heat, you've got to have cold. 
And I said, no, we don't. So Dr. Eric Lindgren has been studying my house now for two years. And Dr. Eric Lindgren is from Sandia. And he has sensors that sense humidity in the attic and sensors that sense humidity outside. And we have not had, we haven't come closer than a 20 degree temperature swing. If it's 40 degrees outside, 20 degrees you would need to get to humidity or dew point. We haven't gotten there yet. We can't come within 20 degrees of a dew point. In other words, we've never hit it. In two years, we've never hit a dew point. So we've never created any moisture. Any residual moisture that you could get coming from the house we're testing a device now that he created that's in my house. And in two years, this little device has got some desiccant material. You know, when you buy a cell phone, you got that little packet of desiccant that keeps it dry, right? We got desiccant in a tube. It's a four foot long tube. We suck it out of the attic. And in two years, we picked out 1.51 1, pounds of moisture in two years. So we don't even have any residual moisture, even though we have a lot of plants inside the house freshening the air. We have a lot of plants. We have a constant humidity of 35%, which is wonderful for my wife. She hates high humidity and she can't handle really, really dry. So the house stays at 35%. Yes. Can you talk about um, finger jointed lumber? Yes. But it's recycled and the cost is less. So I have two questions about that. What dimensions did you get and how much did they cost? The finger jointed lumber is not less, in fact the amount of lumber that you would have to use is less. Finger jointed two by fours, I may have improperly stated that, finger jointed two by four lumbers in two by four uh, eight foot sections to build the walls is 10% more or was 10% more than a standard stud. But you use a third less studs and you don't have as much waste when you do with the finger jointed lumber. The other thing is it helps you as a builder Chris, you can say to this too, if you're building on 24 inches on center and you buy a four by eight sheet of plywood to put on the outside, it always breaks on the studs. So your waste pile, which we had to concern ourselves with, if you're going out to get sustainable energy tax credits from the state of New Mexico, one of the things is how much waste did you produce? We actually had to show them pictures and document how little waste we produced when we built our house. So we documented that extremely carefully just to get a sustainable tax credit. Now, the bad news was this program unfortunately had some glitches and my father was not able to use his $12,000 tax credit until uh, last year. So from 2012, he had to wait a few years to use the tax credit. It was too easy to get to the bottom wrong on this, so some people used it all up. Yes, Can you explain to me your wall assembly? So you're using two by four studs, right. finger jointed studs. I'm assuming there's no insulation in between in between the cavities. Oh no, we're putting some R11 okay. and okay. R13 in there. We and do then, put some fiberglass for for sound deadening okay. in particular. Uh, so we don't really. So use you're getting it for R13 fiberglass. Yeah, R13 then, fiberglass. And then half inch on the OS, exterior. OSB outside of the studs? And OSB and outside then, of that. And then rigid foam. No, the foam actually goes on the 2 by 4s to stop any possible thermal bridging. Okay, so it's before the OSB. Before okay. the OSB. So, <coughs> exterior wall? That's on an exterior wall. You want to stop all of your thermal bridging. So you take that piece of material right here. You can take a piece with you. You take this and you put it on the outside of your studs. Okay, and then over that you put your OSB. That way the stud, uh, a tremendous percentage of your thermal bridging goes from wood to wood. So if you stop the wood from ever touching the outside wood, it doesn't go out and it doesn't come in. Okay, so I guess my initial impression was that by using this styrofoam, you're not going to have to be using the typical types of insulation. So are you saying that you kind of put it on top of that in a way, like an added thing, that it helps you retain a more level temperature, like a good temperature inside the house, like extra? Or are you actually able to use less as far as maintaining that? We haven't studied the fiberglass, to be honest with you. 
we used the R11 and the R13, either one. We used R11 on the interior walls and R13 on the exterior walls, primarily for sound deadening. Okay. We put it in the cavity. Now see, the thing that you gotta understand about cavities, like four foot on my, on my ceiling, 48 inches of dead air space, according to the ASHRAE code book, you get 0.75 R value for every inch of dead airspace. Correct, Chris? Yes. So if you've got 48 inches of dead airspace in your attic, you got an R30. You got R30 right there. So if you put insulation in there, you're not really doing anything to help you, but you may want to put it in there for sound deadening. If you've got something that's going to be outside, like where I live, they race up and down the street in front of my house, and I would prefer not to hear them. So it works. So where do you get this styrofoam? Oh, we've got that set up. You can buy it at Lowe's now. Go over to Lowe's and pick it up. Is it expensive or? <laughs> no. No, when we first started, the stuff was like a dollar a square foot for one inch. Now I think Lowe's, you can pick it up four by eight sheets for 50 cents a square foot. So you're using one inch on the exterior? One inch on the roof okay. to make the cap. Half inch on the, on the exterior walls half inch on the exterior walls and now we test it and, and I will tell you we're still testing uh, we have half inch underneath the floor in my house we have um, three eighths underneath the floor in my dad's house and we have one inch under the floor in other people's house and so far we haven't seen any difference so did you have to argue with the code I if my memory is right code under slab is two inches of rigid foam is that it, correct that's correct and until they found out that Oak Ridge National Laboratories had found out that rigid foam absorbed 15% moisture in the first five years. Even a closed cell? <laughs> rigid foam insulation, according to Oak Ridge National Laboratories, is not a good thing to put under your concrete, Chris. Okay? Does it work? Sure. Does it have drawbacks? Absolutely. So Do you need it? Using expanded polystyrene, you're fine. You use expanded polystyrene and you're going to be so much better off. And you can go up to one inch. No problem. But did you have to argue with any of the code officials? Of course you have to argue with the code officials. And I said, don't argue with me, guys. I said, talk to Andy McGowan. So that's, that's, my, next, that's my next question. How do I find your reports? Are they, a, are they a printed on, are they online? Yeah, believe it or not, they are. I told the Los Alamos scientists that they, and Sandia scientists, that they had my permission to freely, freely, publish these to the Department of Energy's website. They're published nationally. So we're literally going to have to train our code officials. You're going to need some help training your code officials. That's what I do. When I wrote the code official approval for this plumbing-based fire suppression system, that was the most challenging in the world. And that, that's an Upanor, Upanor system, is that correct? It was. We let Upanor have it for 10 years, then we took it away from them. The patent on the top of that is my, my partner, Franz Haas. Um, so, so the picture on the top left, your water recognition tank. Yes. Uh, you said that you had to kind of like work with the municipalities to let them let you have that, right? You do. You have to get the municipalities to understand that it's a plumbing system, because most of your plumbing inspectors will look at that and say that belongs with the EPA. And until they actually see that you have the NSF stamp and that you have the Uniform Plumbing Code stamp, and in most cases in New Mexico, until they call JT Baca in Santa Fe and say, JT, is this really a plumbing system? <laughs> They're not going to believe you. But once they talk to JT and he says, yeah, Doug knows what he's talking about, you're good. So are they going to start carrying things like that tank at places like Home Depot or Lowe's anytime soon? No. 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 Where would people be able to get that type of thing? That's a good question because I was the last person that was making them, and I don't have anybody that willing to make them now. I'd be more than happy to teach people to make them. If you know anybody wants to start a business making these tanks, I'd be happy to teach them. Is it in your book? Uh, no, that's not. You should write a book so, about it. I should write a book about it, I know. You're talking about the plumbing the assembly. I can go to Tank Depot and purchase that tank, is that correct? You can go to Home Depot and purchase a tank, yeah. Now, that was another thing that was really good because what JT did in his wisdom, he is a wonderful guy, he told me, he said, what happens if 
This is a, a tank for two people. This is a two-person family. What happens if you've got eight kids? And three of them are daughters. <laughs> Anybody got any daughters? I've got daughters. <laughs> I know how long a showers they take. <laughs> there again, we got the solar system to heat up the 80-gallon tank so the daughter can take a 15-minute shower. What happens if you got three of them taking that? You can make this tank as large as you want. As long as this configuration on the top is the same. You've got your hydrogen peroxide dispenser, you've got your your pump to pump it, you've got your um, ultraviolet light that it has to go through, you have the purple pipe. By the way, it took me three tries to get the right color purple pipe so that everybody would know that this is reclaimed water going outside. Okay? But it's not a big deal. You can buy purple pipe now at any wholesale plumbing supply house. You, I think you can even buy it I don't know where you can get it, but I can get it if anybody needs it. So, yeah, this tank can be any size. Family of eight, you may need to have a 500-gallon tank because you're going to be saving that much water. So, potentially, if you overflow, it'll just overflow back into your sewer? Yeah, if your overflow goes into the city sewer. But that's why you want to have it balanced out so that you use your reclaimed water to do your urban reforestation Put your trees in, put your grass in, put your shrubs, put your garden in, and even animals could drink it. It is not potable water. It is classed as recreational grade water. Just gray water? No, it's classed as recreational grade water. So you can irrigate grass and plant it? You can blow it in the air. That's why you need the ultraviolet. That's why you need your ultraviolet light. There, there were some technical building issues that, you know, we want to always work with the building officials, always. And you want to give them any report that they want. And every building official, I've always offered them any one of these scientific reports. And the scientists, God bless them, have all said, any of you guys want to call me and talk to me, please call me, talk to me. <coughs> yes? I have one more question, and that should be all my questions. Um, on your picture board up there, on the bottom right, you talked about the instant water boiler using natural gas. Um, that actually sounds fantastic to me because... That right there, yeah. Yeah, uh, recently we did a water heater and we used that PEX pipe, which was fantastic because we had a small space to work with and it worked great with it. I'm just wondering, where would you get something like that? Amazon.com. That's, and are those, how much do those usually run? Get the new one, depending on how much you actually need, but they have a new one out, and Ritz came out with it. It's called an N-O-R-I-T-Z. And Ritz came out with this new one that is fully modulating, I believe, down 10,000 BTUs up to 120. And it's like 750 bucks. Okay. Would that and have a licensed plumber put it in. Would that be able to actually um, suffice in the place of, say, a 40 or 50 gallon water heater? Yes. You'll get four point, I think, they, I believe that they said 4.5 gallons per minute out of it. 